Irish Home Rule by William E. Gladstone. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Irish Home Rule by William E. Gladstone. I may without impropriety remind the House that the voices which usually pleaded the cause of Irish self-government in Irish affairs have within these walls during the last seven years been almost entirely mute. I return, therefore, to the period of 1886, when a proposition of this kind was submitted on the part of the government, and I beg to remind the House of the position then taken up by all the promoters of these measures. We said that we had arrived at a point in our transactions with Ireland where the two roads parted. Quote, you have, we said, to choose one or the other. End quote. One is the way of Irish autonomy, according to the conceptions I have just referred to. The other is the way of coercion. What has been the result of the dilemma as it was then put forward on this side of the house and repelled on the other? Has our contention that the choice lay between autonomy and coercion been justified or not? What has become of each and all of these important schemes for giving Ireland self-government in provinces and giving her even a central establishment in Dublin with limited powers? All vanished into thin air, but the reality remains. The roads are still there, autonomy or coercion. The choice lay between them, and the choice made was to repel autonomy and embrace coercion. In 1886, for the first time, Coercion was imposed on Ireland in the shape of a permanent law, added to the statute book. This state of things constituted an offense against the harmony and tradition of self-government. It was a distinct and violent breach of the promise on the faith of which union was obtained. The permanent system of repression inflicted upon the country a state of things which could not continue to exist. It was impossible to bring the inhabitants of the country under coercion into sympathy with the coercion power. It was then prophesied confidentially that Irishmen would take their places in the cabinet of the United Kingdom, but it has been my honored destiny to sit in cabinet with no less than sixty to seventy statesmen, of whom only one, the Duke of Wellington, was an Irishman, while Castlereagh was the only other Irishman who has sat in the cabinet since Union. Pitt promised equal laws when the Union was formed, but the broken promises made to Ireland are unhappily written in indelible characters in the history of the country. It is to me astonishing that so little weight is attached by many to the fact that Irish wishes of self-government were represented only 
by a small minority. Now what voting power are the 80 members to have? Ireland is to be represented here fully. That is my first postulate. My second postulate is that Ireland is to be invested with separate powers, subject no doubt to imperial authority. Ireland is to be endowed with separate powers over Irish affairs. Then the question before us is, is she or is she not to vote so strongly upon matters purely British? There are reasons both ways. We cannot cut them off in a manner perfectly clean and clear from these questions. We cannot find an absolutely accurate line of cleavage between questions that are imperial questions and those that are Irish questions. Unless Irish members vote on all questions, you break the parliamentary tradition. The presence of 80 members with only limited powers of voting is a serious breach of that tradition, which ought to be made the subject of most careful consideration. Now come the reasons against the universal voting powers. It is difficult to say. Everything on that side Irish, everything on this side imperial. That, I think, you cannot do. If you ask me for a proportion, I say nine-tenths, perhaps nineteen-twentieths, of the business of Parliament can, without difficulty, be classed as Irish or imperial. It would be a great anomaly if these eighty Irish members should come here continually to intervene in questions purely and absolutely British. If some large question or controversy in British affairs should then come up, causing a deep and vital severing of the two great parties in this house, and the members of those parties knew that they could bring over 80 members from Ireland to support their views, I am afraid a case like that would open a possible door to dangerous political intrigue. The whole subject is full of thorns and brambles, but our object is the autonomy and self-government of Ireland in all matters properly Irish. I wish to supply the keynote to the financial part of the legislation. That keynote is to be found in the provision included in our plans from the first, and wisely and generously acceded to by Ireland through her representatives, that there is to be but one system of legislation as far as external things are concerned, that will be found to entail very important consequences. It has guided us to the conclusion at which we arrived of unity of commercial legislation for the three kingdoms. By adopting this keynote, we can attain to the most valuable results and will be likely to avoid the clashing of agents of the imperial and agents of the Irish government. We can make, under cover of this proposal, a large and more liberal transfer to Ireland in the management of her own affairs than we could make if we proceeded on any other principles. 
the principle to which we are bound to give effect in Ireland is. Ireland has to bear a fair share of imperial expenditure. I will now release the House from the painful consideration of details, which it has pursued with unexampled patience. I must say, however, for my own part, that I never will and never can be a party to bequeathing to my country the continuance of this heritage of discord, which has been handed down from generation to generation, with hardly momentary interruption, through seven centuries. This heritage of discord, with all the evils that follow in its train, I wish no part in that process. It would be misery for me if I had foregone or omitted in these closing years of my life any measure it was possible for me to take toward upholding and promoting the cause which I believe to be the cause not of one party or one nation, but of all parties and all nations. To these nations, viewing them as I do, with their vast opportunities under a living union for power and happiness. To these nations I say, Let me entreat you. If it were my last breath, I would so entreat you. Let the dead bury their dead, and cast behind you former recollections of bygone evils. Cherish love, and sustain one another through all the vicissitudes of human affairs, in times that are to come. Footnote Irish Home Rule by William E. Gladstone Delivered in the House of Commons February 13, 1893 End footnote End of Irish Home Rule by William E. Gladstone Recording by Robert Scott Mojo Move 411 dot com m o j o m o v e four one one dot com september the tenth two thousand and seven